What drives property price growth? Especially in this new era of lower interest rates, lower inflation, lower capital growth in general. Because if you want to one day live off the fruits of your property portfolio, if you want to build a substantial asset base, you're going to have to own the sort of properties that grow at wealth-producing rates of return that outperform the averages. Now, interestingly, today we're going to have two different views. My business partner, Brett Warren, Director of Metropole Property Strategists, is going to give his thoughts and his views. And then I'm going to have a chat with Pete Wargent, who says there are only three factors that drive property price growth. Well, you're going to end up probably in much the same place, and you're going to end up much, much more informed at the end of this as we start with the macro drivers and then work our way down to the micro drivers and then the property drivers. Hey, lots of driving today, but at the end of today's show, you'll have an understanding of how to choose an investment grade property, and that should make you more informed, give you more clear direction of how to move forward. So welcome to today's episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's most trusted property commentator who has once again been voted Australia's leading property investment advisor. That's the fifth time he's won a similar award in the last seven years. Well, by now you know that I believe demographics is a critical factor in determining what's going to happen to our property markets, to our economy, and it's something you should be taking into account when you're making your investment decisions. And I recently read a great blog from my business partner, Brett Warren, National Director of Metropole, um, about demographics and how you can use it as a key to lowering the risk and building your wealth. So that's what I want to have a chat about today. Welcome, Brett. Hi, Michael. How are you going? Great. Thank you. Now, interestingly, we're still doing our social distancing. You're in Queensland and I'm in uh, Victoria, but we speak on a regular basis. And I know that you subscribe to the same philosophy as we all do here at Metropole, that understanding demographics is one of the keys to moving forward with your property investments. What are the areas of demographics that you look at? Sure, Michael. Uh, I think it's a very important factor and I think the comment I made was probably the most important factor uh, because it's a, it's a fundamental. It's not something that changes um, week to week or month to month. Uh, it's an underlying consistent theme. So uh, when we're looking at demographics, probably you know, if we start from a top-down approach, probably the number one thing I start to look for is the owner-occupier percentage. If we're starting at the top, I want to understand and make sure that there's more owner-occupiers in a suburb than there are investors. Now, you made a good point that it is a long-term fundamental, and it's also interesting to just not look at what's happening in the markets right now, but I think we've also got to look at what it's going to look like in that suburb, in that area, in five years and 10 years' time as well. And in some areas, that's not going to change, while clearly in other types of suburbs, uh, the, the demographics will change. So owner-occupier appeal, well, that's one of the strands of our six-stranded strategic approach to choosing a good investment anyway. But, but why is that? What are you looking for when you're looking for owner-occupiers? Uh, it's, it's probably their habits, to, to be honest, Michael. Uh, they're generally longer-term thinkers. So a great example at the moment um, is with these types of situations in a financial environment, the last thing people want to do is sell their home. I know myself, I've got a couple of kids, and I'll do anything to keep a roof over my family's head. I know uh, I've often heard you say, Michael, that people would rather eat dog food or Maggi noodles. It's, it's a similar type of thing. So they'll do anything to hold their home. Whereas if you've got a lot of investors and you, you quite often see this in the mining towns, and it, the markets are affected by emotion, and they're very quick to, to move properties on and um, change with the wind, just like we've seen in the share market recently. Well, not only the mining towns, but clearly the inner suburban, inner CBD areas where a lot of investors rather than owner-occupiers own properties. I think there's also an interesting demographic of what sort of owner-occupiers there are, because they range from young first home buyers 
to more established investors. They've got different incomes. They're at different stages of their lifestyle. Absolutely. So the next point is we're after a certain type of owner-occupier. I'd suggest that about 90% of, uh, of people or, or the demographics we're looking at, 90% have incomes that are either keeping up with the average or inflation or are slightly below. So we're looking for the opposite. We're looking for the 10% that, that have multiple streams of income. Uh, for example, the, there's two people, double incomes. Um, they may receive extra bonuses and commissions because they're in professional environments. They may be investors like us and have, a, have an income from shares and property and other types of investments. And I know some people, as, uh, as Tom Cawley uh, mentions, they have a side hustle or a side business where they're receiving extra income. And their incomes are generally significantly higher than the average. So that's who we're looking for. So you're looking for areas where people have got multiple streams of income, higher income. And this is, again, not a judge of people. The thing is, though, that the rich aren't prepared to commute. They don't want to commute. So these people with multiple streams of income aren't going to get it knocked around as much when the economy changes. But the other thing is that they're all going to want to live in similar locations where there's scarcity, those great suburbs of the inner and middle ring suburbs of our three, in particular, three big capital cities, they're never going to move way out to the sticks and the suburbs and the poor socioeconomic areas and the outer suburbs are never going to become the most affluent areas either. So they're the leafy established suburbs that uh, people aspire to live in. That's one of the good things. They're aspirational. But the other interesting thing happening in a lot of those Brett, at the moment, is gentrification. They're moving. Uh, the nature of the people living there is changing. Certainly. I, I know there's a couple of entry-level suburbs in Brisbane that we target, and I know we do in Sydney and Melbourne as well, where, you know, five or ten years ago there were the retirees that were living there. Perhaps there was some low socioeconomic housing and things like that. Uh, but they're starting to move out of the area, and, and the people that are moving in are these people with maybe double incomes or, or higher incomes there knocking over houses, they're, they're renovating and really uplifting the street. And as you said, the, the streetscape's certainly changing. So you're looking at areas where there's large percentage of owner-occupiers that are going to give stability to the markets. And I remember a blog you wrote years ago when we were having the downturn where you showed certain suburbs showed much more stability in prices than others and it was underpinned by higher owner-occupier percentage and higher wages. Do you dig deeper, Brett, and look at occupation types? Yes, yeah, certainly. And there's a, there's a couple of, uh, I guess, uh, suburb profiles that can give you a, an indication of the, maybe the top two or three types of occupations in that area. Uh, I think also, Michael, now's a really good time to understand the occupation type in each area because the areas we're looking for are people in professional services, potentially IT or financial services, and no doubt at the moment health is thriving as well. So they're the type of industries we're looking for. I guess the areas that are struggling at the moment and, and generally do struggle in these types of situations, particularly at the moment where a lot of work is closing down, uh, areas like tourism and you know retail and a lot of manual labour that, uh, that people can't work at home from and things like that, those types of occupations struggle at the moment and linking it back to the income, if, if you've only got one stream of income and you're living paycheck to paycheck, that's a serious concern. Now, you're getting this information from... Basically, a lot of this comes from the census, but then we buy the census material and we get a lot of research data from various research houses that put it together, pull it apart, and then we analyse it. One of the other factors that I know you've written a blog about recently is what you're going to consider the most important demographic factor that's going to drive property prices moving forward. What's that one, Brett? Sure. Michael, I often hear you talk about affordability and, and people naturally go to the fact that, uh, you know, it, I guess people can afford to do certain things. But I guess what we're talking about is looking for the wages growth where people can afford to live in these areas. They can afford to overcapitalize, knock down houses, spend big amounts of money on renovations and things like that. That's what's going to be able to drive things forward in, into the next five years, especially because people have multiple streams of income their work hasn't been affected. Uh, and those types of areas, as I said before, also that are starting to gentrify, they're the areas that are really going to benefit over the next five years. 
So when we talk about affordability, it's not because properties are cheap. And sure, affordability is as good as it's been for a long time. I know some people are going to complain, no, I can't afford it. But with interest rates being low, it's easier than ever to afford owning an investment property. And once you get the deposit gap, it's easier to own a home today than it was for many, many years. But that's not the sort of affordability we're looking at. We're looking for areas where people can afford to because they've got higher incomes and they're prepared to pay to live in those areas because of the aspirational element of those suburbs, Brett. And, Michael, the, the point also is they can afford to pay extra. Uh, and, and we see this on a weekly basis when we're out and about. People will think in, in these areas and, and to get into these locations or a certain school catchment or close to a train line or a five-minute walk away from work, they're willing to pay an extra $50,000 more than what we are what's a fair price for a property because th- that's an extra, you know, 50000 over a 10-year period. They know they're going to be there for the next 10 or 15 years because they're sending their kids to their schools. And in other areas, that doesn't happen because pe- not because people don't want to, but probably because they can't and don't have the affordability to be able to do that. So moving forward, we have to take advantage of the demographic information that Is there amongst all the research information? The challenge, though, I think a lot of people have, Brett, is they've got preconceived ideas. They already like an area because they live there. They've been on vacation there. They've gone to the Gold Coast or the Sunshine Coast, and it's fun there. And so they think, hey, that's a great area. That's not a good investment criteria, is it? No, and, and we see it all the time, Michael. People come and talk to us and say, what do you think of so-and-so an area or, or this area? They've probably put the cart before the horse. We always talk about, you know, if you, you are talking to someone about a property and they put the property first, it's probably the wrong way of doing it. We have to actually take a step back and assess these fundamentals because the fundamentals don't change from week to week or month to month. They may change over a generation or a couple of decades, but if you can get the fundamentals right, it doesn't matter too much and, and you're going to have a, a greater chance of success with your investment if you get those fundamentals correct. So the bottom line is do the macro study first of a location and what's going to make it an investment grade location because we know location does 80% of the heavy lifting. And then once you've chosen a location or a group of locations that fit in with your budget, then we dig even deeper and find the right type of property, looking at the six-stranded strategic approach. Do you want to just quickly run through the six things you look at for the right property in that right location, Brett? Yeah, and look, I think this is really important, Michael, because I know a great example is I spoke to someone the other day, and I get this all the time, that such and such an area is having a train station or such and such an area is getting a new hospital or something like that. That's fantastic, but the demographics and the fundamentals still have to be there. So as we spoke about, the first thing we're looking for is we're looking for something with a high owner-occupier percentage, and we've explained why. The second thing is we don't buy off the plan. Uh, Occasionally, we'll we'll buy new in the right conditions, but we generally do not buy off the plan. Because we don't want to buy above intrinsic value. In other words, with off the plan in general, there's too many fingers in the pie. But I know we buy new townhouses when it's off a a single builder that's aimed at uh, owner-occupiers without lot marketing costs uh, and display units as part of the building cost. Absolutely. The next one, which I think is really, really important, it's the land to asset ratio. If you're ever going to buy a property, and and even the most rookie investors I ask this question, and they get it right 100% of the time, When you buy a property, if you buy a property for $600,000, which part of the property is going up in value? It's always the land. Everybody knows that. So even with apartments, uh, some apartments, if you're in small boutique complexes, they're going to have a superior land value to, you know, locations 40 kilometres out, even if it's a house on a bigger size block. So it's the value of the land. So land to asset ratio is really important. The fourth thing we look for is a, is a suburb with a good history. And as you know, Michael, in our research and our data, we go back 30 or 40 years to research properties. So if a property hasn't existed or a location hasn't existed for past 20, 30 years, we're not interested. And then when we do, we're looking for two things. The first one's the thing that everyone looks for, and that's capital growth. But the second one is let's look back into these these circumstances like the GFC and the floods and all those types of things in Brisbane and what happened during a downturn? If we're looking at a suburb that has 
drop 30 or 40 percent and takes 10 years to get back to where it was, that, that's a warning sign that there should be some flags there. But most good growth areas may drop 5 or 10%, but 12 or 18 months later, they're back to where they are. And if you're looking to grow a portfolio, that's the fastest way to do so. Mm. So that's number four. Number five, we're also looking for something with a twist. And you can look at two things here. Sometimes it might be the fact that you're in a great school catchment. Uh, it might be walking distance to a train line. But there's also a twist with the property. In some cases, we've able, been able to add a, a second bathroom or a third or fourth bedroom or a combination of both. So something different about the property that's going to add some scarcity uh, and uniqueness to the to the property on top of all those other types of things we mentioned. Well, that's going to be very valuable when the market's down. In other words, if there's three or four similar properties for lease, they'll choose yours because it's got a bigger balcony or got a better aspect or uh, the, facing in the right direction or, or specific views or double garage or tandem carports, just something to make it different to the others. The twist will always make it easier to rent, make it more attractive to tenants, but also it'll increase the value of your property. And if ever you need to sell it, uh, there'll be a queue of people lining up for it. And what's the last of the six strands we're looking for with the property? Well, the last, I think, is probably also one of the most important. It's the ability to add value. You can't add value to shares, you can't add value to money in the bank or gold or silver or anything like that. So property, it's a bit of a trick. And if you're not adding value to your property, it's it's an opportunity missed, I feel. Look, it's not something you have to do immediately. It might be a three, five, seven-year project. But I know that we've had really, really good success with our renovations team and, and helping clients you know, do a simple cosmetic upgrade. And then on the other end, we, we do help a lot of our high net worth clients and get into developments and, and build their wealth significantly faster um, by turning those those are older kind of homes into brand new homes that are in great condition. Sure. So you're forcing capital growth, you're manufacturing capital growth, which I believe is going to be more important than ever, even though it was always important, moving forward as we're heading into a period of low inflation, low interest rates, and to be blunt, lower average capital growth. And Michael, sorry, also lower wages growth. And that's something we talked about before. The, the average person's wages, unfortunately, aren't going to be growing. But these areas, people's wages will still grow, property prices will still grow, shares. So th that gets back to the fundamentals we discussed before as well. That's a really good point. In other words, the differential between the rich and the poor areas, and again, it's not a judge of people, but that's a good point. The rich are going to keep getting richer it means that they're going to have those multiple streams of income and they're going to be in the sort of jobs where wages are going to go up while moving forward, a lot of the manual labour and uh, a, a lot of the blue-collar areas, those areas, those wages aren't going to go up. A lot of those jobs are going to be taken over by artificial intelligence and some are still going to be sent offshore. What that means is that their affordability the ability to pay more really is not going to rise as much as those in the inner suburbs. And it just means the gap between the outer and the inner suburbs is going to get wider and wider price-wise. Yeah, absolutely. And, and unfortunately, like you said, it, it's not a judge of people. It's, it's a situational thing. And by understanding those basics and getting those right and putting them as a priority when you're doing your property research, uh, it's going to help you to create wealth uh, significantly faster. Great. So there we have it. Some of the demographic trends you need to understand to help you become a successful property investor. Now, Brett, I know that your team specialises in seeing beginners, experienced investors, and even high net worth clients. And as a director of the company, you tend to see the high net worth clients. You've been working closely together with me for well, well over a decade now. And your team starts by putting a strategic plan together because having all this information, if you don't know where you're heading, really doesn't make any sense. It also helps you by having a strategic plan, decide what's right for you and what isn't. Because sometimes it's more important to say no to these perceived opportunities than to say yes to them. What's the old saying, Michael? Um, what makes John West the best, the one that he rejects or, or something along those lines? So <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well said. I've made more money by saying no to things than yes to things, but I know what to say no to. And unless you have a plan, it's hard to understand that. So a plan's bringing your future forward and then 
planning to become the person you plan to become to actually give you an opportunity to decide what's realistic, what's possible. So if you want to have a chat with Brett and his team at Metropole, go to metropole.com.au. There'll be a link in the show notes or call us at 1300 Metropole. Thanks for your time, Brett. Thanks again, Michael. We all want our properties to grow in value so that one day there'll be the springboard to build a substantial portfolio that'll provide us the cash machine that we're looking for to enjoy the lifestyle we desire. And while you often hear that property values double every eight to 10 years, that just isn't true for every property. Well, look, on average, well-located capital city properties have increased by around 7% per annum for the last 40 years, which means they double in value in 10 years' time. But being an average, that means half the properties will increase more than that and half might even double in 10 years' time. So what drives property price capital growth. That's the topic I'm going to discuss today with my regular guest, Pete Wargent, who's a prolific author, a chartist, and by way of background, Pete's a chartered accountant, chartered secretary, financial. he's got a financial planning diploma. So you've got a lot to live up to today, Pete. Welcome. Oh, no pressure there, Michael. Thanks for the intro. <laughs> now, if you do a Google search on drivers of capital growth, you're going to find a myriad of factors, including the economy, population growth, supply and demand, affordability, proximity to amenities, infrastructure improvements, rezoning, gentrification, government influences. The list goes on and on. And that's why I think some investors have difficulty, they're just stuck with analysis paralysis. But Pete, in one of your recent great blogs, you suggested there are only three drivers of capital growth. What do you mean by that? Well, the, the thing that got me interested in this is because obviously with Australia probably going into a recession in 2020, there was all the usual uh, forecasts about big corrections and so on, uh, particularly with a focus on unemployment. But the thing is, um, being a Brit who's been through multiple recessions, and I know you've been around long enough to have seen them, it didn't really make sense to me because uh, my experience is that unemployment doesn't necessarily lead to falling housing prices. And, and by the same token, full employment doesn't always drive higher prices. So uh, a number of people have done some work on this. I should name check them. Stuart Weems, who's a regular um, on your, your podcast at Pro Solution. Dr. Cameron Murray, um, who's Brisbane-based, very intelligent guy in this field. And also Tim Boyle of Fin Analytics. And I think Tim in particular said, well, really, there's only three main drivers of property prices, supply, interest rates, and population growth, which drives demand. So I'd agree with that because I think the others are encapsulated in, in those. So with supply, we're talking about the rate of construction, how many properties there are, uh, how many are listed for sale on the market at any one time. Interest rates is really the cost of borrowing. But, Pete, I'd go into a bit more detail than that. I think it's really affordability, and I'm not talking about being cheap. I'm talking about the cost of borrowing, how cheap or expensive interest rates are, and also about the wealth of the nation, the nation's ability to pay. And with population growth, yes, we've got immigration, natural population growth and interstate migration, but in many ways it's also household formation because having another baby doesn't actually require an extra house, it may require an extra room. So in my mind, it's uh, household formation that's a big driver, part of that population growth. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, Australia's population grows naturally anyway, simply because people are living longer. So we'd probably see about 150,000 of natural growth and the rest comes from immigration, as you mentioned. But the thing that often gets missed is that over the past 15 years, years or so, Australia has been very, very heavily focused on uh, young, skilled migration. So uh, international students who go on to become permanent residents, uh, people like myself who came across in the 20 to 30 age bracket with a, a skill. So a very heavy focus on the, the visa for the under 30s. And that is really the, the key point is that we've got a, a very strong demographic pyramid and a record uh, an unprecedented number of people coming into the household formation age. So we've had a number of years where first home buyers were not really very active in the market, but now the government's really pushing the stimulus in that direction. Uh, so household formation, as soon as confidence returns in the economy, 
that's where it's going to come from, not just immigration, but actually just the huge numbers of people who did immigrate uh, to Australia over the past 15 years or so. And they're at household formation age. And while I know a lot of people say, keep the immigrants out, then you wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be here. But they say, keep them out because they're taking local jobs. We found, in fact, that every new immigrant coming in creates three jobs uh, and they're coming in and they're not costing the system a lot because they're not going through schools and kindergartens and they're again coming in at the age where there's going to be a long long time before they put a burden on the health system and the pensions and in those years in between they're going to pay their share of taxes Pete. Yeah totally in fact um, the intergenerational report basically found that that um, uh, bringing in young skilled migrants it increases the tax take increases the participation rate uh, lowers the average age at least in the short term and as you said it, it, it just has uh, a benefit to GDP as well so that there's basically no downside except for uh, sometimes when you have very high rates of immigration there are teething issues but from a purely economic standpoint um, immigration has been tremendously beneficial to Australia and um, people like myself have obviously benefited the the research has, has shown that immigration is a, has been a huge driver Australia's success. So as soon as it's um, practicable, uh, the borders will be reopened probably to tourists from New Zealand first and then uh, international students. And then eventually we'll see the borders reopen. And when they do, of course, Australia is probably coming coming out of the COVID-19 crisis, probably better place than anybody alongside New Zealand as countries that are safe and desirable. Oh, sure. People are going to want to come back here. Now, We talked about unemployment a second ago. Most people would think, well, more people being unemployed, not having money, not having a job or having job insecurity would mean that property values aren't going to go up because there's less people looking for property or, in fact, the other way, property values are going to go down and crash. But that's not what's been backed up by the hard facts, by the statistics, is it, Pete? No. I mean, I think uh, if you had very, very high unemployment, that would obviously be negative for housing. But I think uh, what you probably find as the stats roll in is that a lot of the unemployment is in the youngest cohort. It's often sort of a last in, first out thing when it comes to the labour force. Uh, Casuals are probably uh, dropped out of the labour force, people in hospitality. So quite a lot of um, occupations or age groups where people weren't really in the home buying uh, cohort anyway. And I think if you just look back at, say, the early 90s recession, which is the last time Sydney had high unemployment. Well, in the following year, house prices went up 16%. Uh, Same in 2008-9, there was a a period of, we did avoid a technical recession, but it was a pretty tough time for the labour force. And then the following year, Sydney housing prices were up 13%. And I think uh, it was uh, uh, Pippa, the group Pippa put out some research on what happens to the uh, housing markets around Australia for the five years after a recession and universally positive for prices. So it's not necessarily what you think. No, even though I think we all agree that unemployment is going to take a while, two, three, four years to drop down, but that's not going to affect property prices based on previous history. So now let's look at those three drivers that you mentioned in relation to today's property market. So how are these going at the moment? We talked about supply. So supply is really related to new apartments and new houses being built. And we know that there's a long lag for for this happening. So there was a period of oversupply before, but now it's the other way around. There's actually the lowest level of listings available with the newer established properties than there has been for a long time, Pete. Yeah, so there's probably two different parts. There's the the rate of construction, which has definitely slowed very markedly. And then there is the stock that's actually available for sale on the market, which is um, contrary to what some people might think, is that it's at the lowest level in years and years. So when you're looking at dynamics for rising properties, which is essentially more buyers than sellers, if you like, yeah, a very low level of stock is obviously buoyant for prices. Um, I think um, there probably is something of an oversupply issue in some areas for rentals. So I think uh, people who had student accommodation, maybe Airbnb accommodation in the CBD towers, 
Um, so th there are some sort of pockets of rental oversupply. But if you actually try to look at stock for sale on the market, well, it's the lowest we've seen in years. Sure. So I guess we're falling down to supply and demand, which is uh, a factor in all economic uh, areas. So on the supply side, we're entering this downturn and we are having a bit of a difficult time in the property markets. The coronavirus uh, cocoon can't not affect property values, even though they've been much more resilient than everyone's been expecting. On the demand side, there is the population growth side of things that you're talking about, but also uh, the ability to buy finance, uh, interest rates, as you were mentioning. And we're in, I guess, I hate using the word again, uncharted territory there with interest rates, meaning it's cheaper than ever to be able to hold your own home or an investment. Yeah, so the cost of borrowing, um, so the Reserve Bank really got on the front foot there. Um, so I think we might have mentioned in a previous episode, the the three-year bond yield is a key funding benchmark for Australia, and the Reserve Bank is targeting 0.25% for three-year yields. Uh, they also put in place a funding facility for banks to keep credit flowing. So in terms of what that means for you and me, well, I guess as a home buyer, new borrowers can probably borrow somewhere in, in the low 2% range, and investors maybe near a 3%. Um, so it's essentially the lowest cost of borrowing we've we've ever seen. So obviously, as you mentioned, we've been in a bit of a, a period of shutdown essentially for housing. But when we do come out the other side, if people think that borrowing at two or three percent isn't going to be bullish for housing prices, um, I've got some news for them. Sure. But some are saying, hey, we're going to get to the other side to September. And that's when the uh, stimulus packages are going to end, the holidays on interest rates are going to end, job keepers are going to end. I don't see it that way, Pete. I think it's when more stimulus is going to start. The government hasn't spent all that money and all that effort to get us across and then let us fall over the cliff. No, it's been actually quite surprising. Um, so, Originally, um, it was expected that JobKeeper would cost $120 billion for the government. There's a few reporting errors and issues that came to light in the, in the data. But essentially, the, the main reason that the government hasn't had to spend that much is because um, we've been so successful in containing the virus that activity has started, well, we're at early June and activity in Queensland is getting back to normal, uh, other parts of the country following um, so that does mean that if required, stimulus can continue way beyond September in certain industries or sectors. Um, so that can help to smooth the cliff, if you like. And don't forget as well, there'll be a big housing uh, stimulus package put together. The details we don't know yet, but probably grants for home buyers, potentially for renovation. So I think people will be quite surprised when they see the scale of the stimulus that's coming. Sure. Well, the government's not going to have wasted all this effort to let us all fall over the cliff, as I said. So when we're looking at the three big drivers you were talking about, supply, well, we know that at the moment, other than in certain pockets, there's not an oversupply. And in fact, we're not building enough dwellings. And that's going to mean an undersupply moving forward. Because to get those new big towers out of the ground, not that I'm suggesting they're good investments, but that's what people are building to uh, house large uh, groups of people or the big new estates, that has quite a long lead time. So supply is working in favour of keeping property values steady and rising in the long term. Interest rates was the second one and borrowing costs are low. Population growth, that's the, I guess, the elephant in the room where this year population growth isn't going to be high because immigration is going to be low. Yeah, that's right. So it'll probably drop from around about 1.3% to maybe 05 this year. So still growing. But what we just saw in the short term, there are a lot of temporary visa holders, mainly international students, uh, effectively locked out of the country. So that's why the rental market for student rentals has been pretty weak. Uh, but already there's big a big push to get international students back for the next sector. Australia has been a big benefactor from Asian tourism in recent years. So uh, I think the the lobbying and the vested interest will be very powerful to start travel and the borders opening again. And eventually we'll start to see permanent migration as well. But I think 2020 will see the lowest population growth we've seen for many years. 
but it won't be negative. It will just be a, a slowdown. And in some ways, that's not a bad thing because uh, certainly in Sydney, there was a bit of a bottleneck in terms of infrastructure. Uh, traffic was pretty difficult. So you know, it might just give us an opportunity to catch up and invest in some uh, uh, transport projects and other uh, infrastructure. Well, I bet you the fast train uh, is going to come out of the closet again, but I don't think that uh, that's the sort of infrastructure that's going to be, money's going to be spent on, even though there's no doubt that the government is going to be spending on infrastructure, the state governments and the federal government, to help get our economy working again and help get jobs. So uh, what I'm reading from all this is, if they're the main drivers, and they're our secondary drivers, we understand that, uh, then in a macro level, the property market has got good prospects moving forward, Pete. Yeah, completely. I think, I mean, I mean if, you, if you think about some of the most bearish forecasters, I mean, UBS have been uber bearish for years on Australian housing, but even they are now saying, well, you know, the, the Australian economy is pulling through much better than we thought. Plus there's um, the lowest cost of borrowing we've seen, very little supply on the market. And now it's getting prepared for a housing stimulus. So they've, they've pretty much given up on the idea of price falls. And what we saw, for example, in um, the election last year, what you see when you've got a, a very low period of supply, because there are a few sellers, when the buyers come back, you get this kind of cobweb effect where you get all the buyers come back and there's nothing to buy. And that's what puts the, the prices up. But it's mainly going to be in areas where there is a scarcity of product, um, probably not so much... Uh, sort of in the distant outer suburbs or maybe in some of those new apartments. I think it'll be much more in the um, the sort of owner-occupier areas where there's a um, high level of desirability. I think the other thing is people are going to be looking for quality. At this sort of time, there's usually a flight to quality, so they're not going to get lulled into the security of a rising market and uh, buying secondary properties because that's what tends to happen at the end of booms when they'll buy anything just to get in the market. At the moment, people have still got short memories and they're going to remember that certain properties have held their value better than others, Pete. Yes, yeah. And as you said, I mean, that's almost the definition of a boom, isn't it? When, when even the rubbish is selling. But um, yeah, I think it's it's important to remember uh, the fundamentals because it, we will see, I think, in 2020, unemployment probably goes from, say, 5% to 7 or 8 uh, which is not a good thing, of course. But uh, I think it's important to, to say that there's very little correlation between that and housing prices. And in fact, you'll probably see uh, housing prices on on the mend are probably rising uh, later in 2020. So I agree with you that there are three big drivers, but I think we've also got to make it clear that that's not enough. So you can't just go off and buy any property and expect the drivers to make your property increase in value. So that's a great starting point at the macro level. And then you've got to hone into the right locations. And then you've got to, within the right locations, hone into the right uh, streets and then the right property in the right street. So location is going to do 80% of the heavy lifting, but then you've even got to own the right property in that location. But that's the topic of another chat. So before we finish off, Pete, I just want to remind people that you regularly write blogs on Property Update and you've got your own blogs and we're going to put the link in the show notes to your daily one and to go next level wealth as well. And you've recently started a podcast that I enjoy listening to and you've written a new book. Tell us about the book, Pete. Uh, the book is called Low Rates, High Returns and I've co-authored it with Stephen Moriarty, who's been a full-time stock market investor over the past 15 years or so. The aim of the book is to help people manage their own money in an era where uh, cash in the bank really isn't going to deliver returns. So uh, we've moved into a new uh, paradigm of low interest rates and it's um, it's really helping people to navigate through that those challenges. Well, that's what the focus of your podcast is as well. So I'll leave links to all of those and I look forward to catching up with you again real soon on the Michael Yardney podcast. Thanks for your time, Pete. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Michael. Well, two slightly different views today on what drives property price growth, and clearly there's lots of factors involved, some more important than others. So hopefully you've got some clarity now. We're living in interesting times, and while 
The value of some properties is going to perform very well over the next 5-10 years. Others are going to languish, but that's always been the case. So thank you for taking the time to listen, educate yourself a bit more, and make it less likely that you're going to make mistakes that others have made in the past. If you got some benefit from today's show, why not tell others about it? That's my aim, to make as many people financially fluent as possible. So share the show with somebody. There's a share button in every podcast app, or just tell somebody about it, and why not leave a review, one star, five star, I don't mind how many stars, but leave it on the podcast app you're listening to, that helps other people find the show as well. Now, in between my twice a week shows, you can keep in contact with me on social media, just look for Michael Yardney, or of course in my daily property update briefing, where not only me, but a whole group of experts give you updates on property tax finance money and success catch up with you real soon in the meantime have a great week make it a great week thanks for listening to this episode of the michael yardney podcast which was brought to you by metropole who help their clients grow protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?